Um, many people in the room probably know me from my previous position, um, but I moved um, a year ago and I joined Monfort Investment, so I'll just give a quick background. Monfort is a uh, trading house. I'm not going to give you a long speech. We've grown in three years to over six billion in revenues. We trade everything across the barrel of oil. We're into dry bulk, we're into metals, minerals, and one of the things that we did last year was the what was called the Uniper Refinery in Fajira, which we have now we purchased and have renamed it Fermi, which is Fort Energy. We're producing 65,000 barrels a day of ultra-low sulfur fuel oil for bunkers, so that's 0.1. Although, to be fair, most of that is now blended back to 0.5 and sold into the wholesale market in Fajira. Monfort Maritime Capital, that's something that I'll talk about later in the year. I can't talk about it too much now, but uh, we'll be happy to discuss outside with anybody. It will be a new um, feature for the Middle East. It will be the first regulated shipping fund in the Middle East. So ship financing, what's happened um, over the past decade? Well, evolving markets, we've got political unrest, climate change, recently Panama and Suez Canal issues, we've got all sorts of new regulations, we've got the ESG on the finance side, Poseidon principles, and we've got the alternative fuel issues. So I promise you this is my last boring slide, back to Chris slides from the past that many of you know me to do. I've put this slide up because it represents chaos, and that's where we are. And today I've put my uh, globe cufflinks on because we need to protect the world, and I've put my green tie on because environmental matters, they run through absolutely everything. It doesn't matter whether it's finance, whether it's regulation, alternative fuels, everything that we talk about today is green. So the evolving markets. At the moment, everything seems to be in panic. We have high prices, um, even if we look at the dry bulk market, I speak to some dry bulk owners and they feel that we're in a bad market. Do they not remember four or five years ago when we were earning $7,000 a day and they're complaining about 14? When, okay, the market went to 30, 40, 50. <clears throat> is it a good market? Is it a bad market? What we know is it's fluctuating, it's up and down. If we look at tankers, they've been on a bull run. It dropped from 30,000 to low 20s for a couple of weeks at the beginning of the year and everyone was panicking. Now it's back at $30,000, $40,000 a day, depending on which segment you're looking at. The stock markets, not related to shipping, but shipping stocks are on a bull run as well if you follow them. But everything seems to be going up, down, and then back up again. Where are we within the markets? And what's causing this? Those of you that have seen my uh, presentations in the past, I've used this before, but I like it. It's, um, it's about pollution and what we're doing to our world, and what regulations are coming in. <clears throat> if we look at the CII regulations, there's um, some other panels later where we'll have some esteemed colleagues from uh, class who can probably better answer these questions than uh, this panel, so I'll do that when I'm moderating later. But what's ironic, <clears throat> with the situation with the uh, Suez Canal, if you take a medium-range tanker and you put it via the Cape <coughs> to go to Europe, it gets a better CII rating than going through Suez, even though it spends another 20 plus days, if you include um, loitering in South Africa for bunkering, which is another issue we can talk about. So how do these regulations work and what do they really mean? Um, this is something that the shipping industry needs to understand and we need lobbyists to discuss because it, to me that is a ridiculous um, situation that you have an improved CII rating by traveling at sea for longer, <coughs> transporting the same amount of goods. On to the main thing, we're on finance within the industry here, this is what the, com uh, the topic of the conversation is about. Now if I look around the room, we're on a finance conference. Now I can see many ex-bank colleagues, I myself was a banker for nearly 20 years, I can see quite a few ex-bankers from Abu Dhabi Islamic Bank, Citibank, um, I saw a few others earlier, I'm missing them now. But how many current bankers, oh yeah, Royal Bank of Scotland, I can see there. How many current bankers do we have in the room? Not one. Ah, one, sorry, we have one. So this is what's happened. When I first came out to the UAE in 2009, all of the major banks had representation here. They had shipping desks. Those banks are still here, but a lot of them are now covering the Middle East 
from either Singapore or London. They have taken away and they've shut down. There's very few banks that are actually representing the shipping industry in the Middle East. It's a big shame that those banks have decided to move away from here. Now, owners, as just mentioned uh, by colleagues over here, they're moving to Chinese leasing, they're moving to alternative types of funding. You've got many of the US uh, hedge funds that are now acting as de facto banks. You're seeing lower leverage coming into the industry. It's a lot harder for the mainstream owner, the traditional European banks. If you look at all of the banks, uh, the ABN AMROs, the Nordias, INGs. I was at the Marine Money Conference in London um, two, three weeks ago, and they were all sat there on one panel but there was no alternative lenders. And all of these banks were talking about the Poseidon principles, how they need to meet their regulatory requirements, how they need to <coughs> cover off all their own internal requirements. When they went through all their pitch that they're going green, right at the end of it, they was asked the question, will you still lend against conventional shipping? And the answer was yes. We have to be pragmatic, and we know that we might be doing this in Europe, but the rest of the world is still there and they're still providing finance to the industry and we have to be able to compete with that. This leads me into alternative fuels. Because what do you do as an owner today? Now, again, colleagues earlier, what fuel is there? Because the fact is it doesn't exist yet. If we look at LNG, which is only approximately 20% reduction in emissions, this has been around 30 years. Now, there's not one single LNG bunkering plant or station in the Middle East. It doesn't exist. If you're a container line that's going from Singapore to the Middle East to Europe to America, and you're on a liner run, you can bunker an LNG ship, and you can do that route. If you're tramping MR tankers, mid-sized bulkers, anything like that, around the Middle East, India, East Africa, then you can't get the bunkers. If we look at um, the alternative fuels that are coming up, we have obviously methanol is being spoken a lot about. Methanol, ammonia, hydrogen. Hydrogen doesn't exist yet. I mean, there was one ship that I believe went to Amman. It was supposed to come here for COP28, but didn't make it. So I think when it got to Amman, it had gone dry. Is that correct? I think it had all evaporated, I think was the official line. Um, <coughs> methanol, a lot of the big container companies, they have contracted for dual fuel actual methanol ships. Now, that's great, and they are going to have potential supply around the world, which at the moment doesn't exist. The methanol that does exist is not green yet. It's still as bad as any conventional fuel. When that supply does become available, Again, for the traditional owner, the guy who owns five ships, ten ships, tramping them around in the Middle East or in Far East Asia, that supply is going to be taken up by Maersk, MSC, all of the large companies. They will buy that initial supply up. And even if you have a ship that can run on methanol, there won't be any supply for you to use. So what do you do as an owner? If you're contracting a new building ship today, and it's probably one of the reasons the order book is relatively low in historic terms, is because no one knows what to build. If we talk about ammonia, I've spoken about that many times in the past. Personally, I'm completely against it. It's pure poison. Uh, name one ship on the water that has had um, no engine leak ever. One drop of ammonia in the engine room will kill everyone in there. It's not a viable fuel, in my opinion, and I believe that, uh, again, we have... Uh, various class on uh, panels this afternoon, we can ask them the question where they are in actually classing any potential engines. I believe we've got Portzilla and a couple of others here. I don't think there's an engine that's actually proven to work yet. Wind sails. So I put this picture up. It's what we did 200 years ago. It can reduce the emissions. So I think if you're an owner today, you need to focus on optimizing the vessels that we have, optimizing the design, optimizing Trim, if I were to do a new building today, we would probably work with class on leaving space in the engine room for a retrofit. If you order a ship today, you won't get it for three years. Your first dry dock won't therefore be until five years later. Eight years from now, hopefully there is a viable source of alternative fuels. So 
if I was doing a new build ship today, I would look at the optimization of conventional fuel with all those cost saving measures, fuel saving measures that you can put on board, but leave room for that first dry dock, which would be eight years from now, where you can retrofit the ship. So that's just a brief overview of um, the fuels, the financing, and then we can continue the discussion in the debate. Thank you.